For Christians and Jews around the world, this would normally be a week filled with services and family. It is, after all, both Passover and Holy Week. But the coronavirus has disrupted those gatherings, just like it's disrupted, frankly, everything else. So earlier this week, Jews went online to hold their Passover seders like this. Millions and millions of Christians obviously will do the same today for Good Friday and, of course, for Easter Sunday. But not everyone is putting safety first. There's a lot of governors that are actually still allowing large Easter gatherings. I don't think the, the government has the authority to close a church. Um, I'm certainly not going to do that. Other pastors, they're out now defying stay-at-home orders from their governors regardless of the law, including in this a Louisiana pastor who's still holding services this Sunday, even though he's been arrested for doing just that twice. They're trying to take down our great nation by shutting the doors to the church, but we will not let them. I'm more concerned with not having faith rather than fear. To be clear, you can have faith, but also respect health. But more importantly, there are others that are showing a different and a more practical path, including Pope Francis. He led Palm Sunday services in nearly empty St. Peter's Basilica last weekend, and he will do so again for Easter this Sunday. He is one of many religious leaders who say that doing the Lord's work this year means not going to church. This is one time when I believe that, frankly, we are doing God's will by not going to church. And right now, not being in public gatherings, if you will, is one way we can show love for our neighbor. For more, we're going to turn to Father Dave Dwyer. He's host of the Busted Halo Show on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's Catholic Channel. Father, first of all, good Friday to you. And in a way to get into this, we showed uh, different approaches, uh, I'll politely say it, uh, where you see Pope Francis setting the right example here um, in a haunting image here uh, with no lady in front of him. Yet I see some loons, um, Louisiana, a few other places saying they're going to disregard uh, the, the guidances. You can't do that, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you merely just look at the example of what's happening all around the world, this isn't like a, a split decision. It's not like, well, you know, some people are going this way, some people are going this way. Within our own Catholic Church, pretty much every Catholic diocese, certainly here in the United States, is uh, abiding by our governmental restrictions and those recommended by the CDC that we do not gather in groups larger than 10. And hopefully on Easter weekend, normally, you'd have more than 10. So that kind of rules out gathering. In terms of Christianity, we're supposed to be other-centered. We're supposed to be thinking about the community, all of God's children. And this is probably one of the most poignant times that we can actually live that out and make individual choices that do, in fact, impact the entire world. And I agree with you that some people choosing to not do that seems more selfish to me than pious. Uh, you know, um, we make a joke. I'm not looking to start trouble today, Father, but... Um Sometimes on Easter and Christmas, we'll see people uh, all of a sudden filling in the pews that you don't see them except for that twice a year. That said, I have seen a lot of people who are lapsed who are now looking to faith um, because of obviously the trying times that we're in. And I found it interesting. Early in the week, we obviously had Passover. You have Ramadan at the end of the month. There's a lot of commonalities that faith has and an ability to bring people together when there's more questions than answers. Um, what are the most commonly asked questions you get and what is the messaging that you try and tell people who don't know what tomorrow, let alone next month, holds? Right. So somebody asked a question just a few days ago that was along the lines of, usually for me, Easter is such a joyful time, and this time I don't feel joyful. And the important distinction there is, yes, Easter for us uh, Christians is a celebration of joy, but it's the joy of the resurrection of Christ, which is distinct from being happy or feeling joy-filled because of the circumstances of my life. And it reminds me, and I need to be reminded of this as much as anybody else, that there are people all around the world every day and certainly down through the centuries who when Easter comes around, they don't have the means to put on their Easter bonnet and to have a big family dinner and for any of various reasons, whether it's poverty or, or destruction of families or anything else, that people do enter into the Christ-centered joy of the resurrection even without 
feeling it. You know, like you, I, I take reaction from the audiences from time to time, and, and I got a note from someone who said that they're questioning their faith now. Uh, they lost a loved one, and we see the, the brutal images every day where the most vulnerable among us, Father, seem to be the ones um, that this disease is taking in the largest numbers. Uh, what do you say to someone who says, how could God do this? How could God let someone take my parent, uh, my grandparent, my loved one, my person who had fought through illness before, and because right. of that illness, this is taking them. Uh, right. Obviously, it's not a new question, but it's certainly acute, given all the stories that we see every day. Right. And, it, and it's a question that we don't need to be in the midst of a pandemic to ask. It, it's the age-old question of a loving God that, you know, how, how do bad things happen to us? But we do. We do get that question all the time. And one of the things that uh, we need to know, believing in a God who is somewhat mysterious, and we believe mystery is, is a good thing. We don't like that in our modern world. But that there will not always be answers to questions, particularly questions like that. And we, we could, you and I could have a philosophical discussion about the presence of evil and original sin, but I mean, somebody doesn't need to hear that in a time of mourning. What they need to know is that the community and their loved ones are present to them. And the additional challenge at this time is that even that is hard to do. I mean, we've never been able to answer the big question of, you know, why does God allow evil? But now we can't even just hold somebody's hand and go, I know, I know what you're feeling. I'm there for you. I'm praying for you. So it's a big challenge right now. You know, um, we rightfully every night point out uh, the unbelievable, uncommon valor of some of the first responders here that we're talking about, the nurses, the doctors, the EMTs, et cetera. Um, we've lost a lot of priests through this, too. And I think what people may not realize is those who administer faith, they have gone out and dealt with those neglected by society in big numbers. And by and large, unlike your young self there, a, a lot of your colleagues are certainly aged. Um, so to that end, uh, and I'm not trying to get political here, but sure. sometimes we forget that part of what we were raised on is to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked. And my hope is that right now, when Washington's figuring out how to give help, they remember the homeless, they remember um, the immigrants, that this virus does not take, you know, uh, you know favorites in any way. Uh, but we have to think about everybody communally here um, more than just, you know, red or blue or whatever else. And, and I'm some, somewhat concerned, Father, that message isn't resonating in D.C. Pope Francis has been has been hitting this uh, pretty hard in his message long before there was a pandemic that all of these things, whatever they are, natural disasters or the ecology of the planet, hit the poor the most powerfully, most significantly. They, they suffer the most, more so than the rest of us. So we must remember the most vulnerable, those in our lives who maybe we haven't talked to in a while, who are either elderly or don't have someone to look in on them or don't have the means. Yes, this is a time, Easter is a time, not just to ourselves to feel joyful, but it's a time to particularly reach out to those in need. And finally, Father, um, you say don't mail it in on Sunday. I mean, uh, so often, especially with those kids, uh, you wonder if maybe um, they can, you know, switch out of the sweats here or there. But you say on Sunday, you know, we all get dressed up for Easter Mass here. Make the effort Sunday as well. I have seen, this is actually remarkable, without us prompting, because, because while there have been pronouncements from bishops and even the Pope, nobody has really, not nobody, I've seen a couple of bishops, but very few people have said something like, when you're watching Mass on your laptop, be sure to, you know, answer all the prayers. And, and But people are doing that. I've seen people, I've seen photos on social media where people take either their, their monitor from their computer or maybe their TV, and they have it in their living room, but they put a candle on either side. People tell us that they're kneeling down during the parts of the Mass that are the most holy and sacred to us. And when they're watching a mass live stream on Facebook and we ask for a response like an amen or a Lord hear our prayer, people are putting it in the comments. So uh, I don't I don't feel I have to encourage if somebody's going to be on, on the on the on their couch in their sweats, uh, anything I say is probably not going to change that. Those who are trying to find a way to enter into this, to embrace the holiness and sacredness and joyfulness of this time are finding very creative ways to do it. And I am I'm uh, uplifted by that. That's a, a great message, obviously, on a very important time um, for us Catholics at uh, this time of year. But, uh, Father, thank you so much. Be sure. safe, and I appreciate the time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. All right, when we come back...
he was never elected, never confirmed, and he only got his job because he's related to the boss through marriage. But more and more, it seems Jared Kushner has been given control, unprecedented control, of so many of levers of government, including the nation's virus response. That all despite a host of complaints about the job he's already done. I'm going to be speaking with a Kushner biographer about that next.